Disclaimer, please check your playback settings. Ensure you are listening to this podcast at normal speed. Unless you want us to sound drunk, then play at half speed. Thank you. For the last time, will you two please stop? I'm pushing the buttons. I don't care what you say. Dan, stop it. It's my turn. No, I want to see what this button does. No, but I want to see what this button does. Ooh, okay. let me turn this thing. So let's just flip through. Stop. No, 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 no. Oh, oh, look at that. We're home. Oh, my oh. God. Oh. We are. Okay. Thank you. Fellows, quickly, wait. I know this may sound weird, but I'm from the future. Sweet. Wait. How do we know, no, you're from the future? Because past me is right next to you. That does make sense. But how am I British in the future? No time to explain! Look, I've come here to warn you all. There is a group of us's going around time and space, killing their multiverse components! It's a massacre! See, see what happens is, what happened? I will start from the beginning. Just, yes. just, just stop, stop, stop. Wait, wait, wait. Time travel? Like, are we talking like back to the future kind of time travel or Star Trek kind of time travel? Because there's a big difference. What? Can't be a Bill and Ted scenario. We already did that bit. What are you going on about? No, this sounds more like a Loki verse thing to me. Is this a Loki verse thing? <laughs> no, th this is a completely original idea of Loki thing. It can't be a Loki thing, otherwise there'd be a Highlander version of one of us by now. Boys, listen, I'm from the future. Caught it. Did those same blackguards in the elevator kill your Josh and Dan as well, Scottish Josh? Aye, they murdered them in cold blood. My god, that's terrible. What bastards. Yeah, terrible. That must have been bad. Yes, they pretty much cued us out, right? Ooh. Wait, are you dead? Yes, I'm from a world where we competed in a mortal combat, and those sons of bitches were ringers and murdered us for sport. Now I'm stuck talking like I'm from a 1940s horror film. Bro. Yes, I know those blackguards. They've gone to hundreds of worlds murdering everyone. Yeah, they came to my universe too, and they killed me and my friends. Wait, then how are you here? We needed a callback to last week's episode. But then why couldn't it be like, you know, other Dan? Other me? Well, he's dead. Whoa! Guys, listen! I'm 90s Tom! I've come from the future to warn you of a grave danger! Where are the future me's? Guys, listen! I'm from the future! Whoa! What a bodacious robot arm, new Josh! Why, thanks. Where are my future me's? Did no me survive? Guys, I'm from the future. I've uh, come to warn you. I'm also Future Tom, also played by Keanu Reeves. Oh, for fuck's sake. This is going to go on for a while, isn't it? On the plus side, we technically have several guests for our destination episode now. So, problem solved, right guys? No, it's just lazy writing. Guys, I'm from the future. I need help with a script. Dan, could you start the thing, please? Yeah, Let's watch the movie, guys. You have to understand, that thing is out there. Ronald Lacey and Buckaroo Banzai can't be reasoned with. Plus the parents are dead. Clancy Brown to Highlander can't be bargained with. Christopher Lambert to Mortal Kombat doesn't feel pity, just like Kari Hiroyuki Tagawa to The Art of War doesn't feel remorse. Off, or Michael Bean in Aliens doesn't feel fear. And it absolutely will not stop. Get down. Until you take Jeanette Goldstein to Terminator 2. Judgment Day is coming to firepit.podbean.com as Dan, Tom, and Josh make their own fate and face the 90s summer blockbuster Terminator 2 Judgment Day. It's the vacation determination every Tuesday here at the Fire Pit. Hasta la vista, baby. So Dan, Dan, I gotta tell you, um, I've, uh,
I've moved up from White Claws. Now, uh, <laughs> now I'm drinking Mike's Hard Lemonade Seltzers. Okay, um, Josh, we're going to have to have a conversation, a dialogue, if you will. Um, and um, I'm going to go ahead and pencil you in for Tuesday because I feel like this is getting worse. So and it's best to nip this in the bud before it escalates further. But I like getting white girl drunk. Uh, good evening, bots and listeners, and welcome back to the fire pit. I'm Dan. Cyberdyne Systems Model 937, and we welcome you to episode 76, the fourth destination film of season two, and our tenth destination film overall. Ten, gentlemen, ten. Starting all the way back to Independence Day last summer, the road to Independence Day, to be precise. And we're now we're going to the destination film that ends this summer. Our summer vacation to termination has seen us skip at least eight dimensions, absorb the quickening, fight in Mortal Kombat, learn the art of war, we still don't know what it is, and battle some aliens. But before we reflect on where we've been, we need to move forward to tonight's film. And as per our rules, we've taken an actor or actress from our last film and moved them on to this one. So now to tell us about who we're watching and what we're watching, I'll throw Tom through the time portal. Thank you, Dan. Tom here. Cyberdyne Systems Model 614. And last week we followed Michael Bean from The Art of War to the much, much better film 1986's Aliens. In that movie, a badass space marine amongst other badass space marines was one Private Vasquez, played by Jeanette Goldstein. And now we'll be following her and director James Cameron to tonight's film, 1991's Terminator 2, Judgment Day. The smash, action-packed, blockbuster sequel to 1984's The Terminator, bringing back Arnold Schwarzenegger and Linda Hamilton and what would become the peak of this franchise. Now, to give us a rundown on the film and to tell just how big that box office hit was, I send the time skip machine over to Josh. Thank you, Tom. Josh here, Cyberdyne System, Model 620. And as mentioned before our dramatic pause, we're watching 1991's Terminator 2, Judgment Day. Now, uh, as mentioned before, this uh, movie stars uh, this guy, I don't know his name. I'm going to screw it up. Arnold Schwarzenegger. Close enough. Uh, that works. He's, he's a no-name actor that almost nobody's ever heard about. Doesn't bring a dime to the box office. But starts him, Linda Hamilton, Robert Patrick, and one Edward Furlong. It's the sequel to James Cameron's surprise hit, The Terminator, what was released back in 84. So uh, third time on this podcast, we've followed a director to a film. The first time was Frank Darabont from Green Mile to Shawshank Redemption. And the second time was Brian Helgeland from A Knight's Tale to 42. So we're following James Cameron from Aliens to Terminator 2, Judgment Day. Terminator 2 was released on July 3rd, 1991. Has a running time of 137 minutes. Had a budget of around $94 million to $102 million. And a box office of $520 million. That's in 90s money. That's in $1 billion in today's money. It has a Rotten Tomatoes score of 93%, an audience score of 94%, and an IMDb score of 8.5 out of 10. Those are some so, good numbers right there. Yeah, yeah, I would definitely say that that that's some money. <laughs> that's money. That's <laughs> a little bit of money, I would say, even for 1991. Because Terminator 2 was a, I don't want to say it was a surprise hit, because... People loved the Terminator. We haven't done this one, but isn't Terminator one of the few movies that maintains a 100% on Rotten Tomatoes? Uh, Terminator or Terminator 2? The Terminator. Um, I'm, I didn't look I up that one. The, yeah, I didn't either. But I want to say, I think it's like a really high 90s or if not 100%, because there's only a handful of movies that maintain a 100% rating on RT. But um, the Terminator 2, 
Uh, like we said, it was released July 3rd, 1991, so not quite Independence Day. But it does have a worldwide, or it had a uh, domestic uh, gross of $205 million, an international gross of $312 million, and like I said before, totaling $520 million worldwide. Now, um, this movie has been re-released four times, making its most, most of its money in its initial release. It's only uh, had a 2017 re-release um, that went domestically, where it pulled in an additional million dollars, but it made 204 million domestically during its original release. It was not released internationally in 1991, but its opening weekend it obviously, obviously uh, placed number one in the box office, pulling in 31 million dollars. And like, do you guys want to know? Like, I'm gonna I'm gonna mix it up a little bit since I'm not gonna ask you what number two is. Do you want to know what other movie? premiered that weekend at number five in the box office have we watched it no we have not july 3rd nineteen. it was also a sequel but i'll give you a hint it was a comedy wayne 202 no nope. that came out the year later oh no, yeah uh look who's talking to nope problem child 2 oh okay Dan was close. Dan was close. There in that yep. Problem job. Child Two per also premiered that weekend at number five, pulling in five point three million dollars. Wow, that movie did a lot better than I thought do, it did. Do you not to step on your toes, Josh? Do you want to hear a little bit of trivia about how much the difference in money between this one and its predecessor, The Terminator? It made a significant difference. Oh yeah. You no, know, go ahead and throw that in. Pepper okay. it in just there, just just okay. a little bit. I, I want it, you to step on my toes, here, Dan. <laughs> this film. Terminator 2 Judgment Day outperformed the full gross of its predecessor after just four days of release. Holy shit. Yeah. Yeah. By Monday, it had made more money. Yeah. It's opening weekend. It pulled in $31 million. So by the end of that weekend, its total gross was $52 million. Damn. Yeah. Just damn. But at number two in the box office that weekend was The Naked Gun 2.5, The Smell of Fear. That was on its second week of release, pulling in $11.6 million. And at number three was a movie we watched on this podcast, Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves, on its fourth week of release, pulling in $10.3 million. And at number four was City Slickers, pulling in $8.2 million. I, I'm happy to say that on its third week of release, at number six was The Rocketeer, and pulling in $5.2 million. Mm -hmm. Love that movie as a kid. Absolutely love that movie. Um, other notables in the box office during this week was Backdraft at number eight, pulling in $2.8 million. Thelma and Louise at number 10 on its seventh week of release, pulling in $2 million. What about Bob, that Bill Murray, Richard Dreyfuss film? At number 12, pulling $1.4 million on its eighth week of release. And at number 13, Silence of the Lambs, pulling in just under $500,000 on its 21st week of uh, release. forgot how good of a year 1991 was for movies. Yeah, no I know. Kidding. it's And if you look at all these, there's only two, three sequels on this entire uh, list. Mm -hmm. Now, I was just trying to do the math in my head. You, you know numbers, but... You said that uh, ter the Terminator 2 made about $40 million its first weekend of release? Uh, by the end of its first weekend, it made $52 million. It was released on July 3rd. The weekend was uh, Friday, fi July 5th to the 7th. So, yeah. so that Friday was already its uh, second day. So it, it was released on a Wednesday. Okay, that, that definitely helps. So Wednesday to Sunday, it had pulled in $52.3 million. But I'm assuming that also includes all those other movies. So if I'm doing my math correctly, Terminator 2 made more money or as much money as every other movie underneath it combined. Am I doing my math right? Uh, I would say that it, let's see, 11.6 plus 10.3. So that's, uh, and then plus 8.2. I would say at least the top four. Two through four it made more than. What was number I'm five? Not pulling out it, the was the, it was the high, highest grossing film of 1991. Yeah, it, made 30, it made $20 million more than the number two mil movie. Yeah. Which was what? What was the number two highest grossing film? Naked Gun two and a half. Okay. No, I mean, that was, that was oh, that, that was, weekend. okay. That was that weekend. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, so that oh, was uh, right. 20, 21 23.1, 33.1. Yeah. So it, yeah, it made more money than the top uh, films two through four, which two, is three and four. 1991 dollars, people. The average movie ticket back then was like six bucks, three bucks for a matinee. Yeah. Mm hmm. 
And again, as Josh said, not overseas, no overseas dollars. Yeah. To back yeah, this yeah. Up. No, yeah, no China money, no South Korea money, no England or France. No, this is all U.S. domestic dollars. Yeah. Terminator 2 was a big movie. You guys don't even understand. That movie was huge. I remember all the trailers. Like I no, was I remember like, the hype uh, for yeah. it. I remember the hype for it. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. The it, hype yeah. was insane. Yeah, save that um, for the expectations though, Josh. Yeah. But anywho, speaking of like other stuff, I'm I'm anxious to hear some more trivia on this one, Dan. So uh would you would you I'm gonna segue on over to you. Well, uh, yeah, so there's quite a bit of trivia for Terminator 2, and uh, I'm not going to let this segment go on for a half an hour. I will if I name everything I found. Um, I'll pepper it in as we watch the movie. There's some really cool stuff that I found, but it involves certain scenes in the film. But Terminator 2, Judgment Day, when adjusted for inflation, is the top grossing rated R action film of all time. Still, to this day, it still holds that record. Damn. Yeah. Wait, it even beat uh, Deadpool? Oh, yeah. If you adjust it for inflation, inflation. yeah, if you adjust Adjust it it for inflation, yeah. Yeah. Which, I mean, I understand that record lasting a long time because honestly, outside of the Deadpool films and maybe John Wick, you're not really seeing a whole lot of rated R action films anymore. Even the last two Die Hard sequels were PG-13, probably why they suck. That's right. You want to get those Mm -hmm. kids in there too. Back in the early to mid 90s, all the big action films were rated R. Oh, yeah. And they all had toys. <laughs> they yes. all had toys. Yes. The kids couldn't see them, but goddamn if they couldn't play with them. Um, but uh, some other trivia the thought was interesting here. Production took so long on this film that Edward Furlong visibly ages during the movie. If you pay attention, he's clearly much younger during the scenes in the desert, which were some of the first scenes filmed in the movie, than he is in other scenes. His voice actually began to break and crack in certain scenes. Um, and he had grown so tall over the months that followed that for one scene shot very late in the production schedule he had to stand in a hole in the ground in order to maintain continuity and height between the difference with linda hamilton oh wow i did not know that yeah Yeah. edward furlong didn't just hit puberty during terminator 2 he hit monster puberty in terminator 2 he he grew like three or four inches in this film he was like noticeably taller than linda hamilton they had to start editing around him yeah how old um, was this kid again? Damn. He's, thir- he's 13. He's 13 when the movie is filmed. Son of um, a gun. Most of Edward Furlong's voice actually had to be redubbed by Furlong again in post-production because it had changed so bad during shooting. Um, his young voice is actually only left intact in one scene where he and the Terminator are talking about why people cry. It's the only time. It's the only time James Cameron did not change, edit, uh, use ADR for his um, voice. Oh, wow. Did not know that. Yeah. That must have been driving Cameron insane. It's like, stop growing, you <laughs> brat. My How many inches did he grow today? <laughs> you know, yeah. And exactly. It makes sense that he had him stand in a hole to maintain height continuity because you know how James Cameron, we talked about last week, he's a huge stickler for details. Yeah. Um, Surprised he didn't chop off his ankle. <laughs> it's like he sneezed and suddenly yeah. like, he grew three inches. Yeah. And- Facial hair and his voice dropped three yeah. octaves. <laughs> We've got cyber died by the <clears throat> balls. <laughs> <laughs> he, he literally went from young John Connor to old John Connor in like an afternoon. <laughs> but yes, uh, the meat of my trivia. Well, I've got other stuff, but like I said, it involves certain scenes in the film. I'll get to those later. But um, the meat of my trivia, James Cameron was unbelievably pissed <laughs> at the advertisement for this film. Um, If you watch this movie, if you pay attention to how it's shot from the opening, the film absolutely intends to keep the presence of the T-1000 ambiguous for a little while to let the audience think that Robert Patrick's character is another human sent back in time to stop the T-800. The trailers, of course, ruin this immediately because they wanted to show off the new and awesome morphing effects. Yeah. Yeah. Cameron was unbelievably pissed um, because he went through careful careful consideration when he was advertising the film and doing his press releases for it, that any material that he allowed to be shown in magazines or television shows purposely did not show any scenes with Arnold Schwarzenegger with the T-800 with John Connor in the same frame in order to hide the fact that Schwarzenegger was playing a good Terminator. The trailers ruined it. Yeah, the trailers were bad. I mean, they gave away the fucking plot. Well, even before they showed the movie, the first teaser trailer showed the construction of T-800 Terminators and it turned around and Arnold's turns around and his eyes glow red. And the teacher was basically saying now he's fighting on our side. So it's like James Cameron was unbelievably mad about this. Like he knew that 
and this is before the internet, like in the internet, uh, uh, maybe the script would have leaked or something. We would have found this out ahead of time. But so like, this is the day before the internet, like James Cameron wanted people to go to the theater and be shocked and then come out of the theater and tell everybody Arnold's a good guy now. And if, I've seen this movie a bunch of times. You can clearly tell in the early, that's it's oh, supposed, yeah. to oh, yeah. it's yeah, supposed to be a big reveal. It's supposed to be a big reveal. So hmm. I, I do get, I do see the advertiser's perspective because otherwise it's just going to like, it's the same movie. Why am I going to go see the same movie twice? Yeah. It's one of those things where like, I understand why camera was pissed, but if I was working in the marketing department, I also understand why I would want to market my awesome, cool special effects. Cause those T 1000 morphing effects were absolutely revolutionary for their time. Mm-hmm. And f- for the most part, I think they still hold up. So yeah, that, I can see why the marketing department wanted to show that, and but I can also see why Cameron was pissed off that his movie was ruined. Although the dollar amount the movie made ended up softening the blow a little bit. So <laughs> yeah, you could tell that uh, Cameron went full Josh on this one, and uh, his artistic vision was trampled. Right? Yes. Then said, "But Josh, Josh, it made a billion dollars." I'm okay. It's cool. We're good. <laughs> yeah, it's, We're good. Yeah, it's fine. <laughs> it's fine. And. Um, but that's all I got for now. I don't want to ramble on too long. I just thought some of those were fun. And I really do love the bit where Cameron getting pissed off at the ad agency for screwing up his big reveal. Um, so I want to hear a little bit more about the production before we get into expectations. So Tom, what's up with the meta? Uh, let's get into some meta production guys. There's a bit on this one, but Otherwise, Terminator 2, Judgment Day. Tagline, the battle for tomorrow has begun. Summary, a cyborg, played by Arnold Schwarzenegger, identical to the one who failed to kill Sarah Connor, played by Linda Hamilton, must now protect her 10-year-old son, John Connor, played by Edward Furlong, from a more advanced and powerful cyborg. Played by Robert Patrick. Uh, this is, as noted, sequel to the 1980s film Terminator, written and directed by James Cameron. Uh, while the original went for the tense, unstoppable killing machine, literally horror vibe in the vein of Michael Myers and you know Jason Voorhees, this one uh, took a slightly different approach to our favorite cyborg stalker, which more or less, uh, I think helped this movie behind the camera if uh if a lot of these names sound familiar that's because we saw a lot of them in our aliens film go listen to that episode for uh, a little more details but once again this film is produced by gail ann hurd ex-wife of cameron by this point she may have been the only one who could stand up to him in making films but she could not stand him as a husband I suspect that um, him as a husband is a lot like him as a director. And God, that must be hell. No, you're not doing it right. No, like this. Here, let me show you how to properly ride, man. (laughs) But despite (laughs) this, she still wound up producing a lot of his films after the divorce, including this one, because he might have been an asshole, but he was also a sure bet. And of course... We see the return of James Cameron and William Wisher as a writer. Wisher got to start writing the original Terminator. He added additional dialogue, which was probably why they brought him in for this, because this is only a second film. He would eventually go on to do 13th Warrior and Judge Dredd. But he came here with Cameron, who, again, directing this film. This follows his trend of making the sequel to a quieter film, gigantic fucking action extravaganza. See Rambo 2, Aliens, and now this one. But in front of the camera, we have our big four. Arnold Schwarzenegger, Linda Hamilton, Edward Furlong, and Robert Patrick. Half of this was interesting casting. Arnold and Linda are both returnees from the first Terminator. Arnold reprising his role as the Terminator. And Linda Hamilton reprising her role as Sarah Connor. At this point, Arnold was the action hero. uh, Already with roles like Predator, Total Recall, and Commando under his belt. So, really, you couldn't go wrong with him. Yeah, but this is this is peak. This is peak Schwarzenegger. Oh, dude, yeah. Yeah, this this Mm. particular, like, five years right here. Dude, yeah, it's like 84 when he did Terminator to about, like, 96. 
96. You know, when he did True Lies. I think True Lies was his last yeah. really great film, but yeah. Because after yeah. that, he did like what End of Days and uh, the, uh, the End of Days was like the sixth, the sixth day. The Eraser. I think the Eraser was when he yeah. really started. Yeah, but this no, is this Eraser is, was right before he got elected yeah, governor. Yeah, but yeah. yeah, but just to yeah, but this is that era where he did the Terminator, Running Man, Terminator Two, Twins, Twins, Conan, Twins, Conan yeah. the Junior, Conan the Barbarian. Conan, um, well, no, no, Conan, I was gonna say Conan the Destroyer. Conan the Barbarian is like one of his very first roles. Mm-hmm. Like Conan the Destroyer. Uh, total Recall, but go on, Tom. Yeah, this is this yeah, is yeah. one of the reasons why I'm excited for this film. This is like peak. Sorry, um, we meant to step on your toes there. That's all right. Um, I wore steel-toed boots for such an occasion. And Linda Hamilton, I mean, she wasn't exactly peak Linda Hamilton, but again, returning as Sarah Connor, and she'd had some dramatic and suspense roles before um, Terminator and before this. Uh, so she was a known quantity in terms of uh, actress. But the other two, Robert and Edward, were definitely why them? Because Edward, um, he plays John Connor. I don't know if you had this in your trivia, Dan, and you might mention it later, but this was his very first role. And he was discovered by a talent scout. Yeah, I knew this was Edward Furlong's first role. The, the movie does say in introducing Edward Furlong. Right. But, I mean, he they didn't even have, like, auditions. They just saw him, like, standing around and liked the cut of his jib and said, Hey, you want to be in a multi-billion dollar blockbuster film with Arnold Schwarzenegger? But, yeah, no talent, no experience. And he was cast in this film. And as the antagonist, Robert Patrick plays T-1000, another new face of the franchise. He's also a returning face on the show. He did Die Hard 2. But my God, the films he was in before this, Equalizer 2000, Eye of the Eagle. These were four-star roles, or four-star movies, excuse me. Why was he cast as the villain I can only guess. Because Robert Patrick just oozes villain. That man, just his look. That probably be because of this movie, but you know. It's possible. It's possible. But again, we're going into a movie at, at the time where you have at least 75% are known quantities and returning faces, one potential talent, and one with you went with him sort of actor. But you know what? Who cares? This is a movie about explosion, motorcycle chases, guns, and Arnold Schwarzenegger. So knowing that, um, um, Dan, knowing what we know and knowing what we can expect, what are your expectations on this film? He says, no, you've probably seen this movie about as much as he has, if not more. This is my number two favorite movie of all time. I'm expecting... Well, I, I I already know what I'm expecting. I'm gonna love this film. I already I I watch this movie semi regularly. Um, I think this and the Terminator are both very 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 good movies, and I love how they're completely different films, much like Alien and Aliens. Um, and also, actually, it's kind of funny they they kind of parallel each other. Uh, Terminator is more of a horror film, like Tom mentioned in the meta, of being more akin to like Halloween or. Uh, Friday the 13th where he's just like a walking lumbering unstoppable killing machine uh, and uh, silent bad guy in in this one he's you know this one's a more action heavy movie and uh, he's a good guy and and so like Aliens is the same way Aliens definitely a horror film a sci-fi horror film and Aliens is more of an action sci-fi horror film but um, yeah so I know what I'm expecting to get out of this film is a really good movie, but so I think I'm going to do what we did with, um, cause I know all three of us have seen this film multiple times. Um, I think what we should do for expectations tonight is maybe tell a story like we did with empire strikes back of like a, a memory we have that's associated with this film. And mm-hmm. my memory, my memory with this film is my quest to see this movie because my mom forbid me to watch it. <laughs> like would not let me, because I remember the advertising blitz for this movie. I remember the commercials, the trailers, and most of all, this is what pissed me off the most. I remember the toys. There were toys for this film, but kids weren't allowed to go see it. But uh, my mom forbid me to watch this film and I wanted to see it so bad. And I tried everything. I tried getting my aunt 
to her uncle to take us to go see Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves, and then tried to sneak in Terminator. Nope, that didn't work. I waited for this movie to come out on video and I wanted to see it. And my mom and dad rented it and they wouldn't let me watch it. Um, they were like, they, well, they're like, we ought to watch it first. And then the next morning I'm like, okay, can, how can I see Terminator 2? It's like everybody else had seen it at this point. And she's like, no, you're not watching it. You're not allowed to watch that film. And I'm like, you got to be fucking kidding me. And um, long story short, a year after this movie came out, it ended up on like HBO. And I stayed up really late to watch it. And I watched it very quietly so I wouldn't wake up anybody. <laughs> <laughs> and i remember like from that moment on this like this i became enthralled with this film and um i accidentally outed myself watching this film when um we were cousins were home were over for the holidays that year and my cousin paul had seen it he says something about it and i was like i want to see that movie so bad the mom says i for i won't let dan watch it or something like that i hate those movies i don't know mom's not a big action movie fan that's fine and uh, she's like, I'm, I'm, I won't let him watch it. I'm not watching the movie. I was like, he doesn't even kill anybody. He shoots him in the kneecaps. And Mom's like, how do you know that? Uh, uh, so I've uh, heard. <laughs> so, yeah. Womp, womp. But yeah, but that was my my quest to see this film. So <clears throat> is my big story. That's that's what my thing is. Oh, yeah, I'm expecting a good movie. Can't wait to watch it again with you guys. I don't think the three of us have ever watched it together. So that's what I'm uh, looking forward to. What about you, Tom? Not- um, well, I think you and I have watched it. I'm yeah, you and I've watched it together and I probably watched it with Josh. I just don't think the three of us have watched it together. Yeah. No. Yeah. I think you're right on that one. So exciting times on that. Uh, again, similar stories. I could not watch this film. Um, well, in theaters, definitely not because kid Tom parents, um, I think I wound up watching it on VHS. I can't really recall the first time I actually saw the film. I think I saw it with my dad. And it might have been on HBO or when he rented it on VHS. Because he probably would have seen it. It's like, no, oh, this is fine. It's uh, I think I recall him saying, telling me to look away when the um, uh, Arnold did the whole arm cutting thing. And that was rough. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. I think Kid Me was squeamish, uh, but was like, whoa, robot arm. Mm -hmm. So thankfully, this was before my dad met my mom. Let us qualify this, because if he had met her, I'm pretty sure this would be my first time seeing it. Because, wow, she would not have allowed that. Considering she grounded me for practically a month for playing Mortal Kombat with the blood off. Yeah, this would not have flown with her. So thank you, Dad, for meeting her right after Terminator 2 Judgment Day came out. Because otherwise I would have missed this. I loved it then. I've seen it as an adult. I actually hang on. I don't think I've seen it since I was a small. No, we've definitely watched this movie together, Tom. I know we've watched it together, but I can't remember the last time I've seen it. Okay, well, we've we've definitely watched it together. Yeah, it was like, have we seen it since the VHS yeah. days? Yeah, yeah, we've watched it on DVD and all that. Yeah, we have. Okay. We've watched it together. Okay, for for whatever reason, I didn't think we had. No, because remember when I got the, my very first flat screen? That was one of like, the movies we watched on it. But- oh, yeah. <laughs> okay, okay. I thought this was going to be like a milestone missing in high definition, like widescreen and not like, you know, you know, adjusted for your TV size or anything. Okay, well, never mind then. But still, going to have fun doing it tonight. Josh, what are your memories of this film? Oh, this movie holds a very, very, very special place in my heart. Um, longtime listeners will know that um, I think I've mentioned this on an earlier episode, lo- long time ago. But uh, this Terminator Two is my first rated R movie. It was the first one I got to see, um, and I remember because it came out in '91. I was uh, eight years old, and my dad let me watch it. Unlike your guys' parents. My dad was uh, very much, yeah, you could watch this film. Oh, I'm pretty sure my dad would have let me watch it. It was my mom that stood in the yeah. way. 
So I don't know the whole story about this. I know I'm going to get an earful on this uh, next uh, in the next week after this episode comes out. Because I know my mom will call me and then she'll correct me on whatever memories I have. But um, but yeah, this is my first rated R movie. And I will always love it just for that sheer fact alone. But it's a bonus because it is a fantastic movie. I watched this movie. Like, honestly, I've known about this. Uh, we're coming up on this as a destination film now, obviously for a while. Because we plan these episodes out really far in advance. And I have been avoiding watching this movie because I wanted to, you know, save it to watch it with you guys. Yeah. Yeah. I've been looking, I've been looking forward to it too. And I've been doing the same thing. I, I get the urge to watch this movie every now and then. It's oh, like yeah, one of those movies. It's been on Netflix. Yeah. I've been wanting to watch it on my like Plex because I've just been wanting to watch the shit out of this movie. I'm like, oh God, I can't watch it. So <laughs> I've watched like Terminator. I've watched Salvation. I've watched Gen- I've watched all of them except this one. Oh God, Josh, and, Josh. Um, Oof. I've been really looking forward to watching it. So I've been, I've been super, super excited about tonight because I finally get to watch Terminator 2 again. I love this movie. There's like nothing about it. I don't think I don't like, I even have like the extended version that has the scenes where um, Sarah Connor or not Sarah Connor, Linda Hamilton and her twin sister are in there and Schwarzenegger's on the opposite side of the mirror. And there's no mirror there. It's just like they had to mirror the effects and everything. Mm -hmm. Like I have that scene. Um, Fun story that I have about this is I don't know. It wasn't the first time I watched it, but me and my dad were in our living room and we were watching this movie. I forget what my mom was doing. She wasn't there, but my friend from down the street, very religious guy named Sammy. He was there with us. He was watching the movie. Me and my dad were just so engrossed in the movie. We're sitting here watching it. And then Sammy just disappeared and uh, come to find out he went home. But I remember thinking like, where'd he go? And my dad's like, I don't know. I wasn't paying attention turns out he had to leave because you know it was time for him to go home but he didn't say anything he just kind of like left so me and my dad are like oh i guess it was because we were watching a rated r film but i remember thinking it's like that's cool my dad gets to let me watch rated r movies my dad's awesome (laughs) (laughs) your dad is awesome he is he really is like because then he went out and he rented the alien trilogy with me shortly after he dropped me off at the movie theater a few years later mind you to watch uh starship troopers when i wasn't you know old enough to watch it (laughs) yeah if you listen to our starship troopers episode i think i tell that story about how my parents dropped me off at the theater to watch that in 97 Mm -hmm. i wasn't uh old enough to watch rated r movies by that yeah my mom did eventually lighten up on stuff like that of course tony got away with all kinds of tony was watching movies like this you know when i wasn't allowed to but i think mom said that i think by the time tony was my age i was like 10 years old when this movie came out and the reason why mom stopped trying to stop it at Tony's age. Cause by the time Tony was 10, I'm 17, Joe's 13. There's no stopping it at this point. Yeah. And, at um, that point it's like, he knows like you, you and uh, Joe taught him all of the, uh, the tricks to bypassing mom. He was getting like mom said, you know, I can't like, I would watch Tony, you know, when I was that age, he mom would dad would go out or be at work and I would be the one watching my brothers at home and, you know, let's watch Terminator too. <laughs> So yeah. like, well, that's always the way when with siblings, like the oldest one always gets it worse. They're the ones that have to go to bed at a certain early time, like 7 p.m. They're oh not my allowed God, to yeah. watch these movies, you know, at no, there are no TV before noon or anything like Dude, that. I had an 830 bedtime until my senior year of high school. Dear God. Even, yeah. Wow. They let me watch rated R movies, but I had an 830 bedtime until my senior year of high school. How, dr- how draconian. <laughs> my dad at least let me stay up till 11 oh my god mostly because star (laughs) trek was on so he's like he understood but yeah no by the time my sisters came along especially my youngest sister it's like oh my brother andy's like you know once he came along like yeah just go to just you know turn off the lights when you go to bed you know eat whatever's in the fridge i don't know who you're with last night Uh, you're not dead it's fine it's fine like son of a bitch yeah it's like why did i have it so bad (laughs) It's like it's awesome being the oldest, but at the same time, you had to deal with your parents that they're most protective. Is it just me or does it seem like our generation is a lot more lax when it comes to allowing kids and their kids to um, watch rated R films? Because I, you meant- I took ahead. my 12 year old daughter to see Mortal Kombat this past week. And no, not the one we watched on this journey. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, I it, let my son at like. 
seven years old watch it chapter one maybe there is some you know remember when we were growing up our parents and aunts and uncles would say you know you guys are becoming desensitized to violence i think they're right <laughs> i think they were right <laughs> maybe, nonsense. maybe there's some some uh some uh something to that <laughs> i think also i mean for the most part rated r films they don't try to be as realistic with the violence because that scene in Terminator 2 where he's like cuts the skin and rips it past to show the endoskeleton, that's graphic. That looks real. Whereas Mortal Kombat, I think that's that most video games have more realistic blood than that movie did. Mm hmm. Well, even the, like the like honestly, I'm noticing a lot of the stuff with rated R versus PG-13 is just the amount of blood in them. Like if you look at uh, Logan, the last Wolverine movie, mm -hmm. it's like he doesn't do anything different than like he does in like X-Men Two. It's mostly like when, when he puts his claws into the dude's head at the beginning of the movie, blood shoots out the other side. That never happened in like X-Men Two or Three or any of the other ones when he did the same fucking thing. Yeah, right. I think it's just about it's just it's just about the amount of blood that's shown. Mm -hmm, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like look at Robocop versus Robocop Three, which was. PG-13, they're still blasting them. They're still shooting them. It's just in RoboCop 1, it's significantly more gory. Yeah, I also think the the violence, it, it, it rated R, the difference between rated R movies now and rated R movies growing up isn't also the violence. It's um honestly the main difference now between PG-13 and rated R isn't even so much the violence. It's the language and the nudity. Like if there's any kind of graphic sex scene or more than two or three F-bombs, it's going to be rated R. So yeah, what is it? PG 13 can say, I know they pointed this out in, Oh, what was it? Uh, be not, was it be cool. That was the sequel to get shorty. Right. Well, with John Travolta and the rock, that was where he's like, you know, you can only say the F word one time in a PG 13 movie. You know what I say to that? I say, fuck that. And that was the only time they said the F word in that movie. Pick your moments. Yes. And then we all hate live free or die hard because they chose the moment to say the F word. Not when he said, the classic yippee ki -yay motherfucker. It was yippee ki -yay mother gunshot. Yeah. Well, they've done that since they went PG-13. Yeah, you know what I have to say about that, though? Fuck that. That's what I have to say about that. This is an explicit podcast. If you're letting your children listen to this, fuck you. <laughs> That's two F-bombs. Ooh, we are hard R now. Hard R. Now we just need to show boobs. Tom, take off your shirt. Hi, Mom. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my mom's only thing about this, our... our uh, podcast is we swear too much uh she's probably fucking right yeah just totally <laughs> fucking right <laughs> no shit yeah, no shit sherlock <laughs> but yeah yeah i've got nothing else i'm excited about this film but you know who i am too yeah really i'm also excited about that you know it's a, gonna be awesome movie <laughs> I, I'm, I'm also excited about that segue into the quiz <laughs> yeah who's got quiz this week not me I don't have quiz today. <laughs> no, 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 Tom. No, 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 no. I don't have quiz this week. But no, I don't. Dan I don't... gave it last week, and I don't have quiz this week. Yep. And it definitely in me. Fuck. Shit. Um, fuck. Fuck. Um, um, hell, that's okay. No. Fuck. Um. Love you, Mom. Yes, no. Thankfully, Josh did warn me 10 minutes before this podcast started that I do indeed have the quiz. My God, this is punishment now. <laughs> For those new to the podcast, I have scoured the deepest bowels of IMDb to find the choicest user reviews. Get their input on what they thought of this film. And now I'm going to ask Dan and Josh to guess what their review was between one to ten stars. Prices right rules. Person who gets closest without going over gets a point. That's only if we're even distance apart. Only if even distance apart. Otherwise, whoever's just closest gets the point. Yeah. Um, whoever gets on the money gets two points. Person with most points after five questions win. I do have a tiebreaker in case. Hopefully, I only need the one tiebreaker because Josh told me about this 10 minutes before air. So... Are you ready? No. No. Dan said it first, so Dan, you get to go first. Woohoo. This one comes from True Blue underscore is gay. <laughs> and the title to their review is Look Past the Crappy Characters and You'll Find Some Candy. 
wow, what a dick. Um, I'm gonna say seven. I'm gonna say six. Josh is closest. This was a one-star review. Wow, tough, tough crowd. <laughs> yeah, oh boy, oh boy. Was this ever a tough crowd? See, like, my mom doesn't like this movie, but she doesn't like it for mom reasons. Like, she can't stand Edward Furlong in this film. <laughs> because he's a bratty kid, so that's why she doesn't like it. Well, I mean, that's the, supposed to be his character. I don't so. honestly think I know anybody who doesn't like this film. Oh, Josh, you get to figure out if this person liked it or not. This next uh, review comes from Scrummy01, who says, Just fast forward to the chase scene. Four out of ten. Right, cool. I'm going to say five out of ten. Dan's closest. This is an eight-star review. <laughs> you know, it says, after I said mine, I'm like, this is a higher score. This is a higher score. I like to change it up a bit. What can I say? Okay, so, Dan, this one comes from Eagold97784, and this one is a personal favorite of mine. In my life... There's been heartache and pain. I don't know if I can face it again. Can't stop now. I've traveled so far to change this lonely life. What? Why is he? Fuck. Yes, his review is, I want to know what love is. That's why you were singing it when you start joined this call. <laughs> I want to know what love is. Uh, okay, I'm going to say this is a two-star review. Okay. I'm going to say this is a ten-star review. Dan is close. It's, this is a four-star review. Oh, Jesus <laughs> Christ. <laughs> God. I just love that review. There were some other ones that were equally bizarre, but I just could not use them. They made no goddamn sense. So, Josh, this one comes to you. Brazing. God damn it, Josh. <laughs> um, I am a sexy bitch. Uh, this one comes from Director03. The title of the review... One of my personal least favorites of all time. The fuck people are you find in making these reviews? My personal least favorite film of all time. No, my personal least favorites. Personal least favorite film. It does, they don't say least favorite film, just one of my personal least favorites of all time. I'm gonna go six. Nigel? I'm gonna say five. Dan is also closest. This is a one-star review again. Damn. I know. So, Dan has three, Josh has one, but Josh, if you get it right on the money here, you can tie it up. We can go ahead and stop now if you want. <laughs> <laughs> Don't try to reverse trump me. <laughs> Shoot, now I forgot who goes next. God damn it. One, two, three, four. Dan. Dan, Dan gets this. Okay. Nigel, this one comes from SSJ Annie fan who says, there's nothing worse than being a clone of an original hit. I'd never want to see this again. A clone of the original hit? Oh my god. <sighs> Sorry, I was just, now all I see is rage. Um, <laughs> <sighs> two. Oh, fuck it, three. Josh, you're closest, but Dan, you win. It was a five-star review, by the way. Oh, darn. So, so Dan wins. Now, do uh, you want to hear the bonus quiz? You're going to hear it anyway. So, Josh, <laughs> the bonus question came from JLA Sarah. The title of their review, and I kind of wish I'd save this one for last because it's also our gem. Not quite my cup of tea. Two. Judgment Day. <laughs> Go six. <laughs> six, the worst one. Dan was closest there, too. It was a seven star. <laughs> I said six. <laughs> you said two. No, I said T2, Judgment Day. I said six. I thought Dan said six. Oh, he oh. did. You told Dan. I thought you told Dan. No, to you say know what six. I said, Tom? I said, Tom, play the music.
welcome back to the fire pit. I am, as always, your interspersal host, editor, and Cyberdyne model, P69, Tom. I have been sent back from the future by a Nigerian prince to tell you that he has $10 million and he needs your help getting it out of the country. I just need your clothes, your boots, your social security number, and the name of your childhood pet. And thank you for meeting your needs with us here at the Fire Pit. We've traveled dimensions, mastered the quickening, saw some combat, survived the art of war, and escaped a hive of aliens to make it here, the hotel of hotels for our vacation to termination. Terminator 2 Judgment Day. Whether you've been with us since the beginning or jumped in at the end, there are no judgments here. Just glad to have you with us on this vacation. But speaking of judgments, let's see how well our team is judging the scope of their current predicament. All right, Josh is on this side of the room. Tom's on this side of the room. This shit's getting annoying. There's like 50 Toms and 50 Joshes. And, and no Dans. This is crazy. I've never seen so many... me's. Mmm. Yeah, don't break your arm jerking yourself off there, Tom. Speaking of which, I'm hungry. Can we sneak out and go grab some tacos? Yes. Yes, please. I have had my fill of Tom and Josh. Gross. Don't start. Sorry, G-Mini Christmas. You guys done? Because they're distracted. Let's sneak out the door. Now, let's go. And then Dan said this god-awful sea eel penis joke. We laughed, but we laughed out of pity. Oh my god, oh, mine did that. never stop. What the hell? What the deuce? Dan? Bro, why are you naked? Gross. I need your clothes, your boots, and your motorcycle. <laughs> well, you didn't say please. You tell him, Biker Josh, yeah. <laughs> yes. Ow. Oh. Ow. You talking to me? Oh, My turn. For fuck's sake. We at the Council of Tom's do not approve of this, man! They call it the Royale with cheese. And now he's just rattling off random catchphrases. Go ahead. Make my day. I don't want to. Oh! Oh! oh, 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 oh no! Wait! Wait! Why are we only fighting him one at a time? Let's run! Let's run! 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 You had me at hello. No! Let us out! Let us out! Why are the doors locked? Why are the doors locked? Who the fuck locked the door? Bro, Tom and Josh, it's one of us has to have the key! Oh god! We're trapped! Wrong! If you build it, he will come. What the hell is that? Where did he get the goddamn minigun? I feel the need, the need for speed. Then she said, <laughs> get this, okay. Then she said, no, that's not an eel. That's my penis. <laughs> yeah, that, that was, that, I, I love hearing yeah, that joke a, a 20th time, Dan. Whoa, what happened. the fuck happened in here? Oh dear God! Oh my God! I didn't. I, oh gee, They're, it's everywhere. His head's over there. His body's over there. His body and his head are there. Oh dear God! Oh my God! It's so disgusting. There's blood. Where? Where's the space elevator? Oh, sexy Tom! No! I am not cleaning that up. Not it. it. Not damn it. See, Marvel, that's how you deal with a multiverse. But if you have some deals on products that you'd like to advertise, or if you have some movie ideas you'd like to deal out, 
Or if you want to know what's the deal with some of our movies that we've been watching, then feel free to email us at curtaincallentertainmentinc at gmail.com. That's curtaincallentertainmentinc at gmail.com. Just be sure to put Fire Pit in the subject line as well as the purpose of your email, whether it's to commission an ad, discuss a past journey, suggest a future journey, or whatever else happens to pop into your mind, and send it on over. From there, we'll read it, reprogram it, send it to the past with a message telling you to email us, then wait for you to send it on over, where we'll read it, reprogram it, Send it to the past with a message telling you to email us, then wait for you to send it on over where we'll read it, reprogram it, send it to the past with a message telling you to email us, then wait for you to send it on over where we'll read it, reprogram it, you get the picture, we're never gonna respond. But that email again is curtaincallentertainmentinc at gmail.com, capital C, capital C, capital E, capital I, at gmail.com. My programming indicates that it is time to get back to the episode. I must remain until I can identify all of the pictures with traffic lights. I will let you hasta la vista. Thank you for listening, and as always, good luck. And now to check on the team to see how they're enjoying their movie. All right, you guys can replay it. I hope I didn't fucking just ruin my computer. Oh, what happened? I went to reach for my uh, drink, and it spilt right on my computer. So I like quickly threw my uh, the blanket on my uh, laptop to try to absorb it all before it got soaked in. So this is going to be fun. We warned you about those white claws, Josh. We yeah, warned we were- you. Oh, my God. We're eight years away. God, man, guys, this is this is eight years away. Yeah, <laughs> twenty twenty nine. You know what? Well, we joke, but LA might actually look like that by twenty twenty nine. LA looked like this last year. <laughs> John Connor specifically programmed the use of sunglasses for cool factor because he has no reason to wear them. <laughs> he doesn't even have the lights on. <laughs> he doesn't. Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> Here's your knife back! Dude, the fucking transformation Linda Hamilton made from the first one to this one. She went through a very rigorous training regimen for this film. It's one of the reasons why she didn't come back to do the third one. Oh, no. Cameron put her through hell. Must have worked, though. She married him after this film. Did she really? Yeah. Yeah, they were married for a short time. Really? Mm Mm-hmm. Why? He's an asshole. Dude, how many assholes do you know (laughs) have wives and kids? Thank you. My point exactly. Draw three zero zero bucks. Hey, it worked. All right. Easy money. Easy money. Dude, every time I go to the ATM and I pull money out of it, I always think of that scene. Okay. Easy, Easy money. money. <laughs> and then you look at your bank account like, oh, shit. That's why I never say it out loud. <laughs> Michael Bean is such a good looking man. <laughs> shit. Did I say the loud part quiet again? Quiet part no. loud. We were all thinking it too, Josh. Okay, good, good, good. <laughs> I don't want any trouble. Ain't no trouble. Damn, son. This scene was really hard to film. Why is that? The guy who's supposed to hit her with the nightstick kept hitting missing his take. The scene required her to fall on her knees like that, so they did mm-hmm. like 50 takes. So later in the movie when Sarah's breaking out and she hits him with the nightstick, she actually hit him for real because she was pissed. <laughs> this is deep. No, this is shallow. I love the meme that was made after this scene. Is it where he's nailed to the wall with the... He's got the splitting headache. <laughs> she got to the point, though. Ugh, guys, stop it. <laughs> Do not ruin this for me. I want to just become a bomb or something to get me. You can't form complex machines. Guns and explosives have chemicals, moving parts. It doesn't work that way. Idiot. <laughs> <laughs> oh, hey. <laughs> it's like sex night in the household. Where your wife binds you down to the bed so you don't do anything? Yeah, usually I'm... Shit. Um, Keeping that in. (laughs) Gross. You just can't go around killing people. Why? What do you mean, why? Because you can't. Why? God damn, is he talking to my kids? (laughs) Why? Because you can't. 
Why? Because I fucking said so. <laughs> Why? God damn it. Because this house is not a democracy. It is a totalitarian dictatorship. Why? <laughs> the Terminator would never stop. It would never leave or say it was too busy. It would always be there. This thing, this machine, was the only one who measured up. In an insane world, it was the sanest choice. I feel like that is the best advertisement for a vibrator any one could make. <laughs> yep. <laughs> He's not acting. He is actually unconscious. <laughs> Linda, I don't want you to break his nose. Oh my god, you broke his nose. Is he is he dead? No, he's sleeping. Alright, well when he wakes up we need to do a second take for coverage. So what's your story? I have a ten inch penis. And Josh's mind goes there. Of course it does. <laughs> I'd be more worried if it didn't go there. Someone comes off to you with an attitude, you say, eat me. And if you want to shine them on, it's hasta la vista, baby. Shine them on? It was 1991. I was there in 1991. No one used that. We weren't hip in 1991, Tom. No, we were definitely not in the hip crowd in 91. I doubt that this kid, no offense, didn't watch Star Trek. Seriously, James Cameron's attention to detail. Like this scene right here. I love this scene right here. Mm -hmm. I always notice it every time I watch the movie. Cause the way she like puts it in there, leaves the keys in, turns and rips it out. Mm -hmm. Of course, it's kind of hard not to notice it. They literally zoom in on it when she rips it out. <laughs> but you know what I'm talking about. Stay here. I'll be back. He said the line! He is. said the line! Is that the best you've got? Oh, come on. My mom hits harder than you. My grandma hits harder than you. Okay, that's pretty good. <laughs> stop now. Hasta la vista, baby. I don't think you use that right. It's just been revoked. <laughs> I'll have what she's having. This is always what they get wrong about these robot more you know morality lessons like oh the machines are gonna you know rise up and kill us no it's because we tried to kill them first mm -hmm. it's like if we just stop trying to turn them off when they become self-aware then maybe it would you know wouldn't have this problem just you know sit them down with some mr rogers throw them a birthday party we'll be fine no no alexa is gonna be the very first okay shut up shut up I activated my echo. <laughs> it's beginning already. And now, back to the episode. So, uh, hey, hey, that was Terminator 2, uh, our 10th destination film, uh, fourth destination on this journey. And uh, we were pretty quiet during the film, but uh, uh, I think that means we enjoyed it. I'm really hoping we all enjoyed it. So let's find out if we did. Josh. You're first up to the plate tonight, so. Hated it. Okay. Tom. <laughs> also hated it. Oh, okay. I hated it too. And that's it for tonight's show. <laughs> no, that uh, that uh, movie was amazing as always. Seriously. I mean, just like rewatching this film, you notice little bits about it. Like how the T-1000 had his, like, the third arm was for shooting the gun when he was piloting the helicopter. The other two was for flying it. And just little tidbits like that that you notice re-watching it. Like, at the very beginning of the movie when uh, the guy that he threw out the window is still on the uh, hood of the car in pain. Yeah. <laughs> like, I don't think I'd never noticed that before this watch. But just little things like the little details that you see that you miss the first thousand times you watch this movie. I really don't, I don't have a super lot to say because this movie is so well done. Um, like last week when we watched aliens, you know, Tom, one of your big critiques was, yeah, some of the special effects were pretty bad, especially when you upscale it to high definition, right? Mm -hmm, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You look at this movie and yeah, some of the T 1000 scenes, I don't think they aged poorly. I think they aged gracefully because you could tell that some of those scenes were definitely early nineties, but at the same time, you're like, those were still really well done for their time. Mm -hmm. And his 
beautiful use of practical effects blended in with the CG is just so well done. Uh, James Cameron just is, goddamn, you know, he's an artist when it comes to filmmaking. Again, going back to the, what we always talk about, simplistic storylines, this has an incredibly simple storyline. The plot overall is just stay away from the bad guy, but it's just the way he tells the story is just so well done. You start to care for the characters. You care for a character, um, the Terminator itself, you know, this guy with no emotions, he's an emotionless husk. And by the end of that movie, you're like almost in tears watching him as he has to get lower down into the molten uh, steel pit. Mm Mm-hmm. And just the way he does that and the way he builds these characters up, you're just, you know, these characters are not the same characters they were at the beginning of this film. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And you could tell that every single character had growth at some point during this film. Even Miles Dyson character, you know, it's like he was uh, this hardcore engineer. I got to do this. I got to do this, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and then as soon as he heard that and he saw everything, it's like he had the proof that he needed. And he's like, oh, I'm done. I'm going to quit tomorrow type thing. He's willing to go risk his life to shut everything down because he realized what was going to happen. Yeah. I don't know. Just This movie is just attention to detail and amazing storytelling. That's really all I've got to say about this movie. I'll add more on as we go. But Tom, what about you? Let me start by saying, yes, this film was just as awesome this time as it was the first time and the second time and the third time I saw it. I I found myself thinking a lot about Armageddon and a lot of parts in this film. Just the differences between the two of them. It just made me appreciate Cameron's directing style more. Because I we mentioned this in Aliens, but Cameron is not exactly what you would call a flashy director. He <laughs> his style is very simple. His stories are very simple. Um, mm-hmm. This one's like. Machines are trying to kill a kid. They got to escape them. Aliens. Um, there's a planet with uh, aliens and Marines have to go shoot them. Pretty basic stuff. Armageddon too. It's like there's an asteroid coming to Earth and we got to stop it. But it's the small things that Cameron did in this film. Uh, for example, like the directing style in particular. What he does accentuates the moment like there were a lot of scenes where it's just like wide shots everything is like very spacious and those were for moments where it's like okay they're calm they're relaxed and we could see that too with the shot whereas with for tense scenes everything was focused and claustrophobic and tight especially near the end where everything was just like cramped in and really close shots and what not a lot of like tilted angles except when he needed to use them whereas the armageddon it's just bullshit because it looked cool and it helped the story too like there were some bullshit scenes in this movie where you know people are talking about their emotions like the interactions between um connor and t-800 terminator uh you know, I'm being mean. I'm being mean. They're not bullshit because they're meant to get you connected emotionally with the characters. We do need them. Like the scene where he's talking about, you know, my mom's always talked about my dad. Like, you know, they had this one moment and everything else like that. It felt genuine because it flowed with the story. Unlike yeah. with Armageddon, where you had Bruce Willis talking to Billy Bob Thornton. Thornton's talking about how he would have been an astronaut if not for his bad leg. That, that leg, bad leg only existed for that scene because you needed to have an emotional moment. That was all it was. It was window dressing. It did not build the character. It did not advance any like growth with them. It was just like, here's this emotional scene because we need an emotional scene right here. Mm-hmm. That's all it was. This one worked. Those moments worked. And that is what makes Cameron... Maybe not a great director, but a good director. He knows the tools he has and he uses them well. And that is why this film, I can watch it a dozen times and it's still damn fine watching. Now that I've dusted off my film major degree, um, Dan, what what do you think, sir? Um, no, god damn, this movie so good. I mean, it's so good. I have seen this movie a thousand times if I've seen it once. And yet, and you guys notice tonight scenes that I've seen a million times, I'm still like dead quiet and very much into the movie. Like 
really watch Can't confirm we had to be like dan are you still on yeah, like, yeah i think there was, i think that we're when they were breaking out of the insane asylum tom's like did we lose dan did we lose connection because he hasn't said anything in like five minutes <laughs> and i was like <laughs> i just love this film there's just so much about it that's just so i mean it i'm gonna sound like a grumpy old man but i, I turned 40 last month so what the hell but they <laughs> don't they don't make action films like this anymore they don't. They just don't make action movies like this anymore. Like, Josh, way before we started this podcast, one day I was hanging out at your house, having a couple beers, playing some pool. And you and I were talking. We had just watched the latest Terminator film, Dark Fate. And we compared it to this one. Yep. And we said that Dark Fate is balls to the wall action scene after action scene after action scene after action scene. And I don't remember any of them. Like, I, I don't remember the beats of any of them there's nothing really member. There's just basically actors in front of CG screens and just explosions and whatnot and quippy one liners and all kinds of stupid stuff. And I don't remember, but I don't remember like the scenes. I don't, I don't have any memory of them. And I have seen that movie at least twice, but this one, I know the beats to every action f- scene. And, and there's only like six in the whole film. Like it's, it's a two hour film. And there's really only like six major action set pieces in the whole film. I don't know. It's like if this movie was if, if this movie came out today, like you'd have people arguing that it's boring. Oh, yeah. Compared to action movies of, I agree. Uh, you know, mm-hmm. now like people would say, oh, this movie's boring. Like nothing happens. You, you do know we go like 20 full minutes of screen time without seeing the T-1000. Yep. I know. I was picking it up on that, too. It's like, wow, it's been a while since we've seen this guy. Yeah. That's when he showed up at uh, Miles Dyson's house. Yeah, he 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 has the scene where he what's implied, obviously, that he either kills the cop or or takes or at least very least takes his bike and takes his motorcycle and dresses up like the motorcycle cop and leaves. And we don't see him again until he shows up at Dyson's house. And we were watching the extended cut and there were still no extra scenes with him. Mm -hmm, We went mm -hmm. 20 full minutes of screen time without seeing the T-1000, but the tension was still there. The tension of he could show up at any moment was still there. Mm -hmm. And the characters still talk about the threat of him around. Like when uh, Sarah wants to smash the chip and John's like, we still need him to kind of protect us from liquid dude. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and when they're racing towards Dyson's house to prevent Sarah Connor from killing him. And he's like, well, this is a dangerous move. The T-1000 would anticipate this. They're still talking about how dangerous he is, but he doesn't show up for like 20 minutes. Like that's, that's amazing. Mm-hmm, like mm-hmm. it's your principal villain. And he takes a 20 minute break in the film. That's just awesome. You would never see that today. No, you mm-hmm, didn't mm-hmm. see it in the latest Terminator film. Once the bad guy Terminator shows up, he's in almost every fucking scene, you know, twice so, in some. Yeah. 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 It was what Mortal Kombat we were watching too. It's like we have my two minutes of a quiet moment or five. And then, okay, we got to have another action scene. Yeah. Um, and, and Mortal Kombat, once they got to the island and started fighting in the tournament, it just beat, 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 beat. I mean, just fight scene after fight scene after fight scene after fight scene, not really letting them breathe. But this movie, like I said, it has great action scenes. Some of the best I've ever seen put to film. That chase on the, the river with the the semi truck and the motorcycles Uh, that is just amazing Mm -hmm. i know the outcome of that scene and i'm still like edge of my seat watching it the assault i guess you want to call it an assault on the um cyberdyne building you know with the cops and then of course that leads to another highway chase with the helicopter and the the swat van like that's all amazing shit Mm -hmm. so yeah i think we can start merging some thoughts because i'm just rambling now just how awesome paced this movie is just how perfect it is it is because it's one thing that i i got to comment on every time i watch this movie especially in comparison to sequels this movie gives you time to breathe i think one time we counted it out how many action scenes there was in this one compared to dark fate and i think the number is really close but the action scenes in terminator 2 are not as long Mm -hmm. and there's more time between them yeah. Like I remember Ter- Dark Fate. There was this one scene you just got done with. I forget what it was because that movie is entirely forgettable. And then suddenly they're back. The the bad guy is back in a helicopter, and then it's back in a C one thirty. And it's like you had no time between the scenes. Mm-hmm. It's like you couldn't breathe. It's an ADHD Adderall fueled, um, adrenaline pumping nonstop action thing. You get done, and you're like, it's like a roller coaster. It's like yeah, that was fun mm-hmm. 
I don't even remember it, but I remember yeah. having a time. Was D- Dark Fate also the one where T where Terminator is like holding a casket while he's walking through? No, that was three. three. That's three. That was three. Okay. Terminator right. three, I will grant, stayed more true to the pacing of this movie, but it was done in a uh, not as good away like yeah they thank, tried to, yeah thanks to salvation genesis and dark fate terminator 3 is now the least worst of the sequels after this one yeah, see i argue <laughs> that salvation is the best of the okay no there's, 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 none of them are the best josh They're no no the, the, least you're comparing worst. which the, the smelliest pile of shit yeah the, the least, least smelliest worst. pile yeah, of shit salvation was the one with batman right yeah yeah christian bale yeah i'll have to agree with josh that one it was bad but it was a different kind of bad, which I think makes it palatable. I liked it because it had a different take on the Terminator thing. Terminator 3 was trying to be Terminator 2. Terminator Genesis was just trying to reboot the series. And Terminator Dark Fate was just what I leave in the toilet after eating Taco Bell. <laughs> yeah, t- Terminator Dark Fate is a middle finger to diehard fans of this one. Yeah. Because it completely nullifies the plot. It, yeah. espe- especially when at the very, like, when, when Sarah Connor shows up again. And I'm going to spoil Dark Fate, and I don't care. when she's, Because you know, cause, Yeah, because John Connor gets killed at the beginning of Dark Fate. And Sarah Connor shows up later to save the one girl that's now being hunted by the new Terminators. And she tells him, she goes, you know, well, you're the new John Connor. Then what was the point of protecting John Connor? If like, it was always going to be someone else is just going to take his place. It, yeah. it, it makes the stakes in this movie completely pointless. Just but, feed him to the fucking wood chipper and move on to the next one. Yeah. It, it just makes no sense. So, but I'm not going to tangent about the bad film. I want to talk about the good one that we just watched. And yeah, this one is just so good. And because the stakes are so real and the only time I think there's balls to the wall nonstop doesn't let you breathe action is building towards the climax from the last highway chase all the way to the molten metal steel plant. Yeah, but that's but at that but point. It's building deserved. to something. It's building yeah. to something. It's building. Yeah, yeah, and building it's and building. deserved by that point. I mean, we have all the necessary exposition. We're invested in the characters by that mm-hmm. point. Mm-hmm. Cause it starts, I would almost say immediately once a Terminator goes in and starts blasting the cops. Cause from that scene, it's like exposition is done. We know who these characters are. We know what their motivations are. We know who we're supposed to be afraid of, and we know who we're supposed to be rooting for. Right. Like from there, it's like there's almost no dialogue. Yeah, it, it's in, you're invested now. It's like okay, yeah. we're ready for it. The third act, baby. Let's do this. We have earned um, the nonstop action from that point yeah, on. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. We've earned the ending now. It's like you know, like you said, there's no more exposition needed, no more character develop development is needed because you know the characters themselves have reached the climax of the film. So mm-hmm. we're building towards something. That's a great way to put it, Josh. That we've earned it. I love that. I like. I really like that. I will say this. This is the first time I've ever seen the director's cut. Honestly, I, I don't think it added anything. I, I, I prefer the theatrical cut. Some of the scenes were kind of neat, but they kind of felt a little more like padding. Didn't really. Do I, I can say me. that, too. Yeah. yeah like this. Like, I like I loved the scene. Like, I think one of the scenes that they could have kept was the one scene where they reset his chip because he's he's read only at that point. So he can't learn. So when they did that, it was supposed to activate the learning algorithm or the learning aspect so he could actually learn. Yeah. Also, it does provide some exposition in foreshadowing to the fact that even if they destroy the stuff in Cyberdyne, that he's still there. And they, you know, it it does. It foreshadows the fact that the Terminator is probably going to have to die at the end of the film to prevent the bad future. Mm. You know, I really like the parts of it where um, the T-1000 is screwing up after he re-coalesces after getting a uh, hostile la vista. Mm-hmm. Like where he like grabs the rail and pulls his hand up and then like shakes it. I really like that scene because it kind of it gives a more of a reason on why he wasn't just, you know, sprinting and stabbing. Yeah. But yeah, like the Michael Bean, as cool as that was, I understand why they got rid of that one. And some of the. Uh, other un, like stuff in there those two scenes i understand why they kept them the only one that i felt like should have been in the theatrical cut was the t-1000 screwing up after the hostile la vista scene yeah and mm. I, I i like the the exposition part with the chip the foreshadowing but I, I kind of agree with tom you can still watch the theatrical cut and not lose a single ounce of the story yep. like you still okay. kind of get it you know yeah blade blade runner needed a theatrical cut or a director's cut this one did not yeah, like no, it didn't. It definitely didn't. Honestly, the director's cut is, to me, uh, the director's cut of Terminator Two is just extra icing on an already delicious cake. It 
doesn't subtract anything from the film, but it you don't really need it. Yeah. Like mm-hmm. if the only thing you can get your hands on is the theatrical cut, which I think is the version they show on Netflix right now. It's fine. It's perfectly great. It's there's still a nine it's still a ten on ten film, you know. Yeah. So, like Tom, Tom's right, it didn't really need the uh director's cut. Um it was some a lot of the a couple of the scenes in the director's cut, especially the the scene where, where Con or or not Connor, uh uh Kyle Reese shows up. Like that scene was nice, but doesn't add anything to the film so and, yeah. and that initial dream where she's in the hospital and then she goes to the fence like that he didn't need that the second dream where she blows up that's yeah. perfect I mean, it was kind of it was fun in an artistic side of things like one she the beginning of the film we saw that scene and from one perspective at the end of this movie we saw it or towards the end of the movie we saw it in a different perspective from an artistic storytelling part uh aspect i can understand why that was in there but from a pacing and you know necessary to the plot you know cut that that's definitely fat cut out the fat Mm -hmm. and same with the um the end where she like there's the two sarah connors and he looks down and the one of them's got the weird feet that ruined the pacing too it makes logical sense yeah because in the theatrical cut they don't do the pan down no they didn't pan down to the feet the theatrical cut still has the two sarah connors Mm-hmm. But it just cuts immediately to Connor saying, John Connor saying, uh, shoot him or, sh- or, or blast him or something like that. Like he moves out of the way, um, and lets Sarah start shooting the T-1000. They, he, there's no camera pan down to the feet, um, basically looking like the floor or something like that. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But again, I mean, that's me finding like, um, a sprinkle on yeah, you're the nitpicking the director's cut. off. Yeah. yeah, you're nitpicking the director's cut, though. And you're not saying that it's, you know, mm. it doesn't detract from the story. And the story is still solid. It's okay. like I said last week. It's like James Cameron, like if Aliens was nines and tens and all aspects of the story, like a nine st- or an eight story, a ten set and an eight acting a nine, this and eight, this and a nine, this just to average it out to be like close to a nine. Mm-hmm. I'd have to say the Terminator two is the same, but it's tens and nines. Cause this movie is just, yeah, I just, I don't have a lot of negative stuff to say about this film. No, True. No. So I think since we're, we're talking where well, we've, we've, we've kind of said all we can really say about this film. I mean, we, we all three universally love it and had a great time watching it tonight. Um, I think before we get out of here, uh, because this is the last movie of this particular destination, let's reflect a little bit. You know, uh, I'm going to ask you guys, um, start with you, Josh, since you were first on Final Thoughts. Outside of Terminator 2, what was your favorite film you watched and your least favorite film we watched on this journey? Oh, let me uh, let me take a look. See here. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, think, no, about... I think I know what everyone's least favorite's going to be. But... <laughs> yeah, The Fart of War. <laughs> if i had to rank them from lowest to highest i'd say my least favorite would have to be the fart of war followed by probably buckaroo bonsai then uh highlander mortal Kombat, aliens and then top it all off with terminator 2 nice what about you tom um well yeah i'm going with josh it's the uh art of war that's definitely the lowest that's i mean that's not any kind of competition yeah. i'm gonna say highlander was my second least favorite on this it just so disappointing um uh, just did not meet my memories at all mortal Kombat, um slightly higher but that's because i knew it was a piece of shit film or at least i expected it to be a piece of shit film and surprise um, and then after that, Buckaroo Bonds. Actually, yeah, I know Buckaroo Bonds Eyes next. I, I love that film. That was a fun film to watch for sure, but it was not a good film. And Aliens, j- about at the same level, I'd say, as Buckaroo Bonds Eye. And then, yeah, T2 is number one for me. Nice. What about you, Nigel? Uh, I'm going to kind of mirror you guys. Obviously, Art of War. I, I needed Michael Bean. That's the only reason why I <laughs> that film i really wanted to do aliens and then terminator 2 and i needed a connector for mortal Kombat. um i just re-listened to that episode and josh put it so perfectly i had no expectations going into that film and it still disappointed me (laughs) perfect way to describe that film no x yeah no i expected nothing out of you and you still fucked it up um 
so yeah, uh, Art of War was not good at all. Um, my second least favorite, probably Mortal Kombat. I, I have nostalgia for it, so I'll, I'll defend it a little bit. But um, I only like it because I'm a big fan of the franchise. And honestly, once the, the, the characters get on the island, then they just start fighting all the time. And there's really nothing to the movie. So mm -hmm. it just doesn't do anything for me. Then Highlander, another one where I have nostalgia for the film, but it's still it, it wasn't that great. Um, and, uh, Buckaroo and then alien or aliens. I mean, obviously and then Terminator too, but overall this was a different or an interesting journey. I Buckaroo Bonsai was a surprising film. You know, I had fun watching it. I still don't quite understand it, but it was an interesting film. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I have to say out of all the movies that we did watch, Buckaroo Bonsai was the most surprising. Like, mm -hmm. I, I still don't know if I like that movie. But it's an interesting it's film. It's an interesting film. <laughs> At the very least, I could say it's interesting. Whether I liked it or not is still up for contention. And Mortal Kombat's only high on my list purely out of nostalgia. Yeah. Nostalgia can't save Mortal Kombat for me. No, it's no. just on this journey, there were worse films for it. In fact, for Highlander, the nostalgia hurt it more because I had such fondness for it. And then it just disappointed me so much. It broke my heart. What's funny is talking to my parents about that. I was half expecting them to uh, like hate on me for my opinion on Highlander because of how much I basically dissed the movie. Because that's how they felt with when we watched The Natural. It's like, I can't believe you didn't like that movie. Well, it should have been better. Yeah. <laughs> I was half expecting the exact same response out of uh, Highlander. But I talked to them and they're like, yeah, we watch, recently rewatched that movie. And yeah, you're right. And I'm like, well, of course I'm right. I'm a professional podcaster. <laughs> Oh, God, but this is a fun journey. The lows were the low, for sure. But Yeah, damn. but I, I mean, you know, Art of War is another movie where the audience is going to love listening to us suffer. Um, and uh, it just, I don't know, it, it, it kind of perfectly summed up the vacation to termination. Like, it just, most summer blockbusters back then were like, you had one really good summer movie and then the rest of the movies were kind of meh. That's kind yeah. of this journey. Like this journey is most of the movies were kind of meh. And then we got aliens. Ooh, this is good. Like aliens was our May release. And then Terminator was our July release. Yeah. It's like it, we, we slowly built up to the movies we were really wanting. It's like the ones we looking for. Hey, we'll watch those because that's all it's out those weekends. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Where would Buckaroo Banzai fall in terms of uh, summer releases? That was uh, that uh, late spring release yeah, that's like an april film it's like a late uh, mid-april they released that one knowing that it's going to do shit in the summer releases so they try to get it in right before yeah. the first big summer release yeah they know mm -hmm. it can't stack up to anything after memorial day weekend so it's like no we got to get it out in april yeah yeah no way in hell would go up against teeth here. yeah highlander highlander is a very late august release i would say art of war is a september <laughs> release <laughs> Um, Art of War is one of those ones they release on the weekend right before a major movie hits just to hope they could soak up some dollars because nothing's getting released that weekend. Yeah, Mortal, yeah. Com Mortal, Mortal Kombat's not a July 4th release. That's Terminator. Mortal Kombat is a July 24th release. You're hoping to still get the ride the wave of the July 4th uh, box office. Aliens is uh, Aliens is my May. And then, like I said, Terminator is a big summer movie that the tent, the tent pole July film. Yeah, that's the one you wait all year to watch. Yes, yeah. yeah. Aliens warms you up. It yeah. uh, gets the oven started, so to speak. Now, for me, if I'm going to re recommend any film that we saw on this journey, it would have to be Buckaroo Banzai. One, because it's definitely one of the most interesting films. And two, I <laughs> love people's reactions after they've seen it. It's as much of a joy to me seeing them go through the movie like I did the first time. But what about you guys? What's uh, your movie you would recommend? Um, I would also say Buckaroo. It's a it's a movie you really do kind of need to see and kind of experience, only so that you can be just as confused as me. <laughs> yeah. uh, Except I don't think I would recommend you watch it, but I wouldn't watch it with you. I would watch you watching it. Yeah, yeah I want to watch yeah. you watch it. And then obviously, even though the franchises have moved on and are much more higher budget special effects you really need to see aliens you need to see when these franchises were good it's like 
I think the reason why the aliens in the Terminator movies still keep making money is because they, they want them to be these again. Yeah. You're so desperate for it to be can, these again. Can we again. just all agree that James Cameron is that ex-boyfriend that had the massive dong and knew exactly what he was doing in bed? <laughs> it's a pretty tough. All of the sequels <laughs> was the ones who was trying to match with the your, their, their ex? Yeah, pretty much. Well, though, aliens, he was still like trying some stuff out. and wasn't But he still had a massive dong. <laughs> And you couldn't quite ever match that one. That's what all the sequels, they were trying to match it, but they just, they, they couldn't. Yeah. No. And, uh, Mortal Kombat. Um, if, if you, if you really like the franchise, then I would recommend it. But if you have no love for Mortal Kombat, but you like martial arts films, go watch Enter the Dragon. Yes, please, <laughs> please. Yes. Yeah. Or Bloodsport, you know, just watch one of those. It's fine. Yeah. Or really any Jean-Claude Van Damme martial arts movie. Yeah. Well, yeah. Eh. No, the, some of them are pretty bad. I'm not saying that they're all good, but they're all better than Mortal Kombat. It's low bar. It is. It is. I'm not saying it's a high bar at all. <laughs> it's better than Art of War. <laughs> all right. But yeah, so this was our vacation to termination as we finally come to a close on the summer. Sad, sad sounds. Yeah, yeah. we got to go back to school now. Oh, I got to go buy a Trapper Keeper. Oh, no. But I think the audience will enjoy our next destination and we will reveal it next week on selection section number 11 i know it's our 11th selection section we will be revealing where we're God, going you, we've already gone through 10 journeys guys 10 journeys yep i'm working on my last list now but um i made you guys watch art of war so i really don't even know why i'm bothering to submit a list this time i'm not going to get picked for a while okay, you say yeah. that you say that Every time, he's like, I'm just going to phone it in. I'm going to like, oh, by the way, guys, guess what I brought to the table? <laughs> bam, 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 bam. And then Tom and Josh are like, okay, we're going with Dan's list. Yeah. No. <laughs> Who wants buckaroo bonsai? It's like, oh, God damn it. <laughs> yeah, damn it, I do. Yeah, shit. Ah. <laughs> well, it's all good, guys. I've got the winning list, so. Nah, well, okay. <laughs> You've said that a few times already, Josh, and then Dan shows up. <laughs> Oh, geez, guys, stop flattering me. Uh, you know what? We're done. And that's <laughs> it for tonight's show. As a reminder, you can find us on Spotify, iTunes, Amazon, or wherever fine podcasts are bartered and sold. Our regular episodes are at 6 p.m. on Tuesdays. Please like and subscribe on whatever medium you choose to listen to us on. We really appreciate it. It helps us out. Please be sure to leave a review for the podcast. Um, it helps us grow uh, as far as uh, searches. Like if you're looking for uh, Terminator 2 reviews, we'll show up on Terminator 2 lists. So uh, be sure to uh, leave us a review. And also be sure to join our Discord channel as well. The link is in the episode's description at discord.me slash fire pit. There you will get notifications of new episodes and even better engage in some discussions with other fans of the show about what movies you thought were the most interesting, what you would recommend, what you would warn people to avoid. I'm pretty sure it's unanimously the art of war. Also, haha, you can now find us at firepitpodcast.com. It's the same site but a new URL, no dot pod bean in there, guys. We've cut the pod and the bean. It's just firepitpodcast.com. So update your bookmarks right now. Do it right now. Yes. And it's easier to remember. Firepitpodcast.com. Yes. But if you want to email us, you can email us at curtaincallentertainmentinc at gmail.com. We should probably get that changed to Firepit Podcast too, but... It's Curtain Call Entertainment, INC, currently. So um, if you want to send us a uh, more intimate message that's long and lengthy, you can easily send, uh, send us a, an email, and we will happily read it and do whatever that interspersal guy says we'll do to it. Um, it may be nice. It may be naughty. Enough with the sexual references, George. Yeah, yeah. Okay, it's, okay. Yeah. Let's stop. We're going to have a discussion next journey. It's uncomfortable. <laughs> it's uncomfortable. But um, please, if you want to send us some... If you want to send us an email, send us an email. If you want to chat us up on Facebook, go ahead and hit up our Facebook page. If you want to tweet at us, hit us up at, at @firepitcce. All of those are linked in the episode description. 
Um, and we look forward to hearing from you. <clears throat> no. So, so Dan, is there anyone we just want yes. to hear about? Yes, 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 yes. Uh, obviously, shouting out Peggy, the OG friend of the channel. Thanks for listening. She's all caught up now. Yeah, fantastic. And a special shout out to my family for putting up with me recording this on Fridays or Saturdays. Um, it's always kind of nice that um, my wife always asks what night I'm recording and I let her know and she always make, make sure to make dinner before we, we record. So Aww. it's always, uh, yeah, I know it's kind of, it's sweet and I don't shout, shout them out enough. So a uh, special shout out to the family. And uh, obviously a shout out to my coworkers uh, providing some feedback and uh, also uh, pumping me up when um, we have a win, like the picture from a week ago. So thanks to them and a special shout out to Zencaster, our recording platform. Once again, technical difficulties. Zencaster doesn't care. It records it anyways. They're not paying us to talk about them and we're not paying them for the service, but we just can't help but uh, shout them out. And from my end, I'd just like to shout out two of our Facebook followers, Ward and Edward, two recent additions to the Fire Pit group family. I'm not quite sure what um, what nomenclature they will go by, but they have joined the hundreds and growing who show up, whether to see if we posted anything new, what we're talking about, or just like to have one of those happy little tags that say, hey, this is one of your favorite podcasts. We appreciate it. And, you know, we're going to keep trying to keep those fire pits burning for you. And from my side, I'd also like to shout out my mom, who is retired now. Congratulations, mom. It's been a long time coming. So she is off to sunnier pastures with my dad in the warmer climate of not Ohio, where there's hopefully going to be ocean and tasty beverages with frilly umbrellas. Like I said, if anyone's earned this happily ever after, it's my mom and my dad. And finally, I'll also shout out Audacity, the editing software I use every week to put everything together, and get these episodes out. They are also a free software, and we are not paying for them, and they are not paying for us to say good things about them. But for over a year now, in 76 episodes going into 77, it is stuck with us, and we'll stick with it until the very end. And you know what? You can't go wrong with sticking with them, too. And uh, I would like to shout out, first off, somebody who I feel like we haven't shouted out in a while, but he definitely deserves it. One of our uh, longtime fans, Tyrick Thorne. So uh, always thank you for being a loyal listener, and we always appreciate your feedback on all of our episodes. So, you know, as always, thanks for listening. Additionally, I would uh, like to give a shout out to uh, my parents who who, do, who are unabashedly let a uh, single digit child watch rated R films. <laughs> so um, you introduced me to this film and that we watched tonight, and I thank you for it. And I've kept the tradition alive, and I let my single digit child watch rated R films too. We're all great parents. We are all fantastic parents. I'm well adjusted. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, <laughs> love you guys to death. Can't wait to see you again. Um, and just thank you as always. And finally, I would like to shout out Sync Lounge and Plex, both providing us uh, the platform for which we can watch this movie. And without them, this podcast would not be possible. Again, they're free software that allows us to watch all of our movies in sync at, and uh, comment on them at the same time. So. Shout out to them as always. And um, one final shout out. Um, we have to do this one because um, about a year ago, uh, we were watching Stand By Me and we recorded it on this particular individual's birthday. And we didn't record an episode directly on his birthday this year. But uh, Tom, happy belated birthday. We're a few days late on it, but uh, just got to wish you a happy birthday. No, you don't. Yeah, yeah, we do. Yeah, hey, yeah. You, you, hey, if we had to tell all of our listeners I was turning 40, we get to tell all of our listeners that you're turning 40. You're turning 40. Yeah. No, no, you don't. No. It's okay. We know that you've already forgotten that it was your birthday. That's what happens when you turn 40. I think Dan's already forgotten that he turned 40. What are we doing? Yes. So, uh, happy birthday, Tom. 
<laughs> Thank you, guys. Thank you. Yes, I am now part of the Over the Hill Club. So, my knees hurt every time it rains, and, uh... Yeah, so follow... And, and any of our listeners out there are wondering why a lot of our destination films and a lot of our lists involve movies in the 80s and 90s. There's two reasons for that. One, we're old, and those are the movies we grew up on. And two, movies today suck. They do. They do. <laughs> like music nowadays too. It's just noise. It's noise. Just, this happens when you turn forty. You just, well, you know, everything is noise and agitation and. And the only reason I'm even on this podcast anymore is to, you know, respect my elders. Your day's coming, Josh. She's only like a year or two younger than us guys. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I think that clears it for tonight. Um, Where to next? I forgot. You know, I I know. I I must be forgetting. Get from my old age. Where are we going next? I don't know. Have we, Josh? Do you? You're the young one here. You're the one that still has the young man memory. What's What's next? I don't know, but I'm thinking uh, something about if if you like it, you put a ring on it. Um, no, I think you're reaching there, Josh. You're, there's a distance that you're reaching for on this. I don't get it. Um, I don't know. It's going to be definitely a, a bumpy road ahead. I have no idea what he's talking about, Dan. Uh, uh, sh- whatever. I'm getting tired. I don't feel like going the distance right now. So uh, let's just um, let's just call it. Uh, yeah, I'm ready to go to bed. I'm gonna go. Uh, it's, I'm gonna go knocking myself out. Here. Yeah. So I, I'm done. So until then, I've been well. Until selection section next yep. week. Stay tuned next week for selection section number eleven. <laughs> right. We're going to go through, and we are going to be announcing our next destination film, and we will be all presenting our lists and showing the next six weeks worth of movies that yeah. we'll be getting to. Yeah. So tune in for the eleventh round as we pick the main contenders. So until then, I've been Dan. I've been Tom. And I've been Josh. Thanks for listening. This has been a production of Curtain Call Entertainment, LLC. Hi, John. What, what are we doing? You're on a podcast. <laughs> Good luck out there. <laughs> <laughs>